Paris, 1876. Louis Pasteur is one of the greatest scientific minds in Europe, and he's turned his attention toward two things, beer and vengeance. Sixteen years earlier, he'd unlocked a millennia-old secret by proving that yeast, in the absence of oxygen, is what ferments sugar into alcohol. And then he thought he was done with beer. Until the war. The Franco-Prussian War, where France lost its hops-growing region of Alsace-Lorraine. For French pride, for French beer, he must again delve into the secrets of brewing in order to create what he calls a beer of national revenge. What he discovers this time are these specific microorganisms that make beer spoil or go sour. And he finds that bringing it to near boiling, pasteurizing it like with milk, will kill these organisms and increase the beer's stability and shelf life. Though this discovery will not remain French, it will inaugurate a new era, the age of scientific beer. Thanks so much to Brilliant for helping us ferment this historic tale. When we left off, beer was going global, and industrialization was about to turn regional breweries into the massive beverage corporations we know today. Troops in British India, previously sickened in large numbers by local drinks, were now sipping on IPAs brewed in the UK. Viennese-style Pilsner was being produced in Mexico, and the twin forces of trade and colonialism were bringing European beer to foreign shores and founding some of the largest breweries of the modern era. In 1869, a Norwegian-American opened a brewery in Yokohama, which would eventually become Kirin. Seven years later, the Meiji government founded Sapporo Brewery, and what would become Asahe followed in 1889. China had an active beer brewing culture for thousands of years, but when grains like millet fell out of the diet, brewing shifted to rice. Yet as European powers carved out pieces of the Qing dynasty in the 19th century, foreigners began re-establishing Chinese beer. Poles, Germans, and Czechs started breweries in Haben, but it was in one particular city that a joint English-German concern found success when it founded a brewery in Qingdao in 1903. Today, China is the world's largest beer consumer, and Qingdao is the second most popular brew in China, surpassed only by snow beer, which traces its origins to a brewery established by Karen in 1936, in what was then Japan's Manchurian puppet state. But things were brewing back in Europe, too, specifically Northern Europe. In 1847, a young Danish man named J.C. Jacobson founded a brewery outside Copenhagen, using steam power and other new industrial technologies to produce Danish Pilsner. With his eye on the future, he named it after his five-year-old son, Carl. Thus, Carlsberg was born. Seventeen years later, it gained some competition when a 22-year-old bought an outdated 16th-century brewery in Amsterdam, determined to modernize it. He hired a student of Louis Pasteur to find and culture new types of bottom-fermenting yeast, and he christened both the brewery and his beer with his own name, Heineken. Together, these rivals kick-started the scientific age of brewing. Both Carlsberg and Heineken approached beer like a research project, establishing in-house laboratories where scientists experimented with new techniques, equipment, and ingredients. Beer got clearer and more carbonated. Meanwhile, the area that would become Germany was going through its own seismic shift that would have major echoes far across the Atlantic in America. Now, we know we haven't talked much about the United States in this series. Partially, it's because for thousands of years it didn't exist. Amazing, I know. But it's also because... Well, American beer was just sort of fine. Sure, it was always there, and often affecting history. For example, the Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock because it ran out of beer, and taxes on brewers helped fund Washington's army. But America's drink was whiskey, which was made easily from barley and corn, lasted longer, was easier to transport, and had a higher exchange value with the young country's largest trade partner, Native American tribes. In fact, colonial Americans drank only a third of the beer modern Americans do, and much less than their British cousins at the time. In fact, as an apprentice in London, Benjamin Franklin was scandalized by how much his British colleagues consumed. Until the 1840s, most U.S. beer was produced in the Northeast, and consisted of English-style ales and porters. Yet America's laissez-faire economic freedom did make for mediocre brew. While most European countries had high standards for licensing breweries and quality control legislation, none of that existed in the United States. Beer was a product, not an art. But a revolution was coming. Specifically, the revolutions of 1848, a largely failed series of liberal uprisings which convinced a whole generation of young, largely middle-class Germans to immigrate to the United States and take their brewing knowledge with them. But when they arrived, they found the older German communities on the East Coast too crowded, especially for brewing. So instead, they struck out for the newly founded cities in the Midwest, where the land was literally free, cereals and hops grew easily, and the cold winters meant ice for lagering beer was abundant. 
There, they founded large and expanding lager breweries and brought the German drinking culture of beer gardens with their friendly, visible, and community-oriented intoxication to America. In 1855, Swabian immigrant Friedrich Müller arrived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and purchased an existing brewery to modernize, christening it with his Americanized name, Miller. The next year, Joseph Schlitz arrived in the city and married a brewer's widow, taking over the business and naming it after himself. But then when the Great Fire of 1871 destroyed Chicago, torching most of the rival breweries, he donated beer to get the city through, earning his brew the nickname, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And then there was Frederick Pabst, who took ownership of his father-in-law's brewery and decided, as a branding exercise, to tie a blue ribbon around the bottles of the beer he'd named for his father-in-law, Philip Best. That's right, Best Beer with a blue ribbon around it. And though Paps Blue Ribbon had never actually won any awards, well, he just never corrected anyone who assumed it had. Miller, Schlitz, and Pabst, collectively known as the Beer Barons, became hugely wealthy, building enormous mansions and funneling their money into everything from resorts to some of the country's first amusement parks. But while they competed, they also banded together. During the Civil War, when Lincoln rolled out new taxes to pay for the conflict, they convinced him that clean, well-made, and healthy German lager should pay only 60% of the taxes that other beers did, giving them a major competitive advantage. But even so, all of them were about to be usurped. Adolphus Bush exited the Civil War both as a corporal in the Union Army and newly married to the daughter of St. Louis-based brewery owner Eberhard Anheuser. During the war, where 200,000 Germans served in the U.S. Army, he must have observed the popularity of lager beer amongst the ranks. When he bought his way into the Anheuser-Busch brewery, he used every modern technology he could find, from refrigeration to break reliance on winter ice and produce Pilsner year-round, to pasteurization that killed the microbes in beer, to industrial bottling machines, to refrigerated rail cars that shipped his product countrywide. He also pioneered branding and marketing, sending branded art and goods like ashtrays to bars and convincing them to stock only his signature beer, a beer inspired by the brews from the Czech town of Budweiser, or as we of course know it, Budweiser. By 1900, Bush was the king of beers in the Midwest, and America usurped Germany as the largest beer producer in the world. Anheuser-Busch was well on its way to becoming the planet's largest brewing company, yet trouble was coming. See, for decades, concerns had been rising about America's drinking problem, and beer, which often flew under the radar, landed in the crosshairs. Because the largely white, Protestant, long-established families, who tended to favor temperance, often didn't like what they thought of as immigrant drinks. The Irish with their whiskey, Italians with their wine, and especially after World War I, these German tycoons showing off their wealth gained from an empire of drunkenness, and that wave of anti-immigrant panic helped sweep prohibition into law in 1920. Ironically, though, Prohibition ultimately proved good for the big breweries. See, they weathered the storm by producing soft drinks while smaller brewers perished. And by killing the competition, it left the macro breweries in a position of dominance that's only changed in the last few decades. And that's how we got to the world we know today. How beer went from something made in Neolithic baskets to a massive product shipped and consumed around the world. But before last call, let's have one final toast across time. Come on, everybody in the past and present, whether you're a beer baron, peasant alewife, Sumerian Nkasi worshiper, colonial Minuteman, Inca emperor, Apache warrior, German monk, pyramid builder, or scientist, let's all raise a glass. Here's to the drink that lubricated the gears of human history, beer. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. You know, before we did this series, I had no idea the amount of science that goes into brewing nowadays, which got me thinking maybe I should finally graduate from simply doing my own research in my own lab to taking that chemical reaction or computational biology course I've been thinking about over on Brilliant. You know, one of the things we really love about our EC community is that a lot of us are lifelong learners, people who are super passionate about leveling up our knowledge, but also like doing it on their own schedule, which is why we think Brilliant, the interactive learning environment focusing on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, you know, the whole STEM set, is perfect for learning at your own pace, replacing traditional lectures with hands-on interactive lessons, complete with visual examples and a storytelling approach that is super engaging. Case in point, Jeff has been brushing up on his fundamentals, having already worked his way through some foundational computer science courses, and is about to jump into some statistics and probability. Whereas I've been really enjoying channeling my inner Mr. Spock and strengthening my analytic muscles with their multi-part courses on logic and deduction because I want to be able to role-play my next D&D character as more of a Holmes than a Watson, if you catch my drift. So if you're a curious learner, professional or inexperienced, you can find out more about Brilliant and buff your brain by going to brilliant.org slash extra credits and signing up for free. 
Ooh, and the first 200 people that go to that link will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription, which added bonus also helps out our channel in the process. I mean, if that's not a no brainer, I don't know what is. The biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One for being fantastic legendary patrons.